Hello, Internet friends. Welcome to the Galactic Comlink podcast, where I talk to fans of Star Wars Galaxies about their love for the game. This time I'm talking to Bree Royce. She's the editor in chief of the MMO news website Massively OP. She's the person I actually heard about Star Wars Galaxies Legends from, so I was very excited to talk to her. We covered all kinds of topics from the early days of Star Wars Galaxies to playing Legends to MMOs more broadly. It was a really fun conversation, so I hope you enjoy listening. Let's get on and have a chat with Bree. So I was reading through my like outline of questions to ask Bree, and I realized they make they they kind of read a little bit like a "This is your life" um, kind of thing <laughs> of your whole life in games, and and I thought, well, maybe that's that's not where I could start because most people will know who you are and what I you don't do. Think so I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I think a lot of people on my channel kind of already know of you and Massively. At least of Massively, yeah. And, that makes sense. But people might be interested in what's an average day at Massively like? That is a good question. No, because we, we don't get to talk about this very much. And honestly, I'm not sure that... I'm not sure how much people want to know until they know how crazy it is. Like they think it's going to be boring and then it ends up being wild. Mm. I mean, for my part, I'm up, you know, first thing in the morning, I sit down, I got my tea, I'm ready to go. And it's triage, like it's email triage, it's Twitter triage, it's figuring out where all the fires are. The comment reports from the night before from the trolls who showed up last night, right while I was right. asleep. And Everything that blew up on Twitter, you know, like in Europe while the while America was asleep or anything news, all the new press releases that hit my inbox, any problems with the actual site, you know, any DDoS attempts that came in. And then like through all of this, we're also trying to get news, like come up with ideas for, for posts for the news team to actually write. <laughs> and then so we're, we're doing that. We're, we're coming up with news. We're coming up with ideas. We're going through the tips. People are like you know, sorting themselves out and doing stuff. I'm trying to write. I'm trying to prove their stuff. Then we've got all of the columnists who are like a whole nother thing. So I've got to do our, our features for the day. I've got to make sure I go through them and edit them and make sure they're scheduled properly. And I don't really take a breath until lunchtime. It's like, boom, boom, boom. That's like the worst, most crunch time of my day. Right. But, you know, for the most part, most of the writers are just writing and research. It's like a lot of social media and Reddit and looking stuff up and verifying stuff. And I do a lot more of the dealing with developers or more like dealing with PR and dealing with, you know, fires. Yeah. <laughs> Internet fires. I guess that's the job. the The editor's job is, is is management, isn't it? It kind of like corralling people and just keeping things on track. And uh, do you do actually an awful lot of what I think of traditional editors in a newsroom, like proofing, proofreading, and checking people's uh, articles and whatnot? Believe it or not, yes. Yeah, right. that's actually the original reason I was hired. So I've been working for first massively and then massively OP for over 10 years at this point. And I was hired to do West Coast editing on when I still lived in California for the other site, the original site. And I kind of morphed into a full-time proofreading job. I barely even wrote anything for the first couple of years. So, right. and it, even then it was a weird thing. It was, not, it was very unusual because I would go to like press events and meet other reporters from other websites and they would be like, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, I copy edit the site. And they're like, what's a copy editor? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, this is not normal. I didn't know. You know what I mean? I was still kind of new to blogging. I didn't really understand that that was really abnormal. And I think it's why the site was so good, why it got such a good repu reputation so fast, because it's generally clean. I'm not saying we never make mistakes. We totally do. But in general, yeah. And I do that a lot. That's like a big chunk of my job personally. No, I think it's important. But speaking of how mass Massively has kind of evolved over the years, because I've been following the site since it was old Massively uh, for years and years and years, going back to the days of kind of, I think, early podcasting when Massively was in the mix with a lot of other sites that seem to have gone by the wayside now. And how impressive it was, what, what you decided to do as a team and how you've managed to not just keep the site afloat, I think it's better than it ever has been. And I did want to ask you kind of, I mean, you talked about it a lot on the podcast already uh, and you kind of covered it, but for, for people who don't know, maybe you could let them know what happened um, with the old oh, sure. site and how you had to transition to a new one because it was a big deal, wasn't it? It looked like the whole thing could go away at one point. Well, it was for us, right? <laughs> yeah. I would have yeah, missed so my favorite podcast. Oh, yeah, favorite... that podcast 
I, I would would know nothing about MMOs at this stage. If mass, massively went away. No way! Wait, wait, wait! When did you start playing MMOs? Well, I mean, I, a long time ago, but massively has been the site that I kind of go to to keep up to date. And oh, I see um, what you mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't mean to try to interview there for a second. Sorry. No, about interview that. <laughs> me as far as much as you like. To actually answer your question, what actually happened was. Um, we were owned by AOL. We were part of the Joystick Network, which at the time was one of the biggest um, video game blogs like in the English-speaking world. And AOL, being AOL and completely incapable of making intelligent financial decisions, decided that it would get rid of basically all of its blogs with the sole exception of Engadget. So that meant the whole Joystick Network, including us, got wiped out. And we were so mad. Everyone was so upset because we knew we were doing well. We had been growing in size in in terms of, um, you know, I don't know about revenue because we didn't get to really see revenue. But you could see from the advertising, from, from the hits that were coming in, we were doing really well. And they had just crunched our budget in half like the year before that. So we were basically increasing our like um, eyeballs. We were increasing the number of people who were reading, even though we had le- less than half the money going into it and fewer writers. And the whole thing was just absurdity and yeah it was it was our readers and several of our writers who were just adamant like look this is a going concern this is a real website that has a solid readership in a niche that needs filling you guys should go to kickstarter and i was like oh i don't know we're not going to pull it off but people made us do it you know the people really really wanted it and so that re- is really the reason we went ahead with massively overpowered because people kickstarted us because people didn't just want it they put their money where their mouth was and mm. they gave us a big chunk of money that operated us for quite a long while while we basically figured out how to how to do what AOL was doing because it's one thing to run you know the newsroom of a website and totally different to actually have to build the infrastructure and organize the advertising and deal with the income deal with you know paying people and payroll and taxes it's a whole nother game that we weren't even doing before and now we are but the trade off is that we completely control what we're doing so that's a good thing and a bad thing. It means nobody is telling me what to do, but it also means that I can't blame anybody else. It's always my fault, right? At the end of the day, those decisions are all in us, but I'll, I'll take that freedom any day. It's been awesome to be this kind of site in this kind of you know environment because most of the sites around us, big and small, are owned by somebody else. Whether, whether or not they're like corrupt, sometimes they're just owned by people who are not on site, who are not really involved in the day-to-day and aren't really interested in like, giving back to the community and giving back to the actual staff that's doing the work. So it's just made all the difference and it's meant that we can be really small and still be really successful. I absolutely love it. I did not anticipate doing this with my life, by the way. This this was an accident that I got into this job in the first place. But now that we're here, I just, I love it. Yeah, I mean, that's the dream, I suppose. If you have a passion for something, that's what we all want to do. It's kind of, how can I make a living doing what I'm uh, good at, yes. but also stay in control of that and not be too restricted by people with oversight and stuff. And it, the whole idea that you that you would have a really successful site, but at the same time and be having your budget cut and stuff, it, you know, at that point, making the leap to say, look, we recognize this, even if the people with the money and the people with the oversight don't, let's do it. It's, it's admirable. And it's something that I think I yeah I think we'd all love to do really. So you've transitioned now also with Patreon to being not just relying on advertising but uh, an ongoing kind of uh, the audience is supporting massively OP now, aren't they? On an ongoing basis. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a big chunk of our budget every month comes directly from people who are contributing to Patreon. The advertising revenue, if you guys are in the business, you know how this works. It's fluctuates. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's like. Ooh, that didn't quite make budget this month. But the Patreon is like, our backers and readers are awesome. Just <laughs> in case you wondered, MMO players are freaking out. Well, good. It's I, I mean, I follow Massively not just because uh, it's a great site and I enjoy listening to you and Justin, but also because um, I've always been interested in MMOs, but I haven't been playing them as much. And uh, I did play a lot of Star Wars Tour and really got into that with my guild and stuff. But after that, things tailed off a little bit. So it was really you and Justin. To- uh, no, well, it was you talking about Legends on the podcast that uh, really well just brought it to my attention and I was wondering how did you first get to know about legends oh that's a good question because let me see who actually first told me about it I think it might have been a reader of our site I mean like 
we had played, I had played Star Wars Galaxies from beta. So it's not like Star Wars Galaxies was, un, was unknown to me. That was like my favorite game of all time. Mm. People make fun of me all the time for talking about this game way too much. So I knew about the emulator. I knew about SWG MU. That, that's how you say it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, knew that. Uh, I say I emu, that. but I don't know if emu, I'm right. Okay. E- emu, emu, but that's a type of bird, isn't it? Australian. bird, right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. I I had played that for a while. We even tried streaming it for a couple of times in in the distant past. We weren't really allowed to cover it on old massively, but nobody's gonna stop us on massively op. So we went ahead and did it. But I didn't have the best time in it. I felt like it was a little stagnant, and that's not really a slam. Like it's supposed to be locked in time. It's supposed to be a snapshot of the original game. So I respect what they're doing, but I wasn't having the best time over there. Personally, my favorite period for for Star Wars Galaxies was like, well, my favorite social period was the first year, but my favorite gameplay period was like the last two years. So that's mm. really what I wanted. So when people started talking about Legends, they're like NGE, naturally your mind goes to, oh, well, it's the beginning of NGE and that sucked because that sucked. But it's not. It's actually one of the last builds of the game that that actually got pushed to all of the NGE emulators. And they got like, they were serious. A lot of emulators end up being crap, just not just in Star Wars, but like everywhere. Ultima Online, World of Warcraft, doesn't matter what game. A lot of them are terrible. They're run in dodgy places by dodgy people. They don't last very long. And a game like Star Wars Galaxies requires you to invest time, especially like if you're going to be a crafter. And I didn't want to invest time into something that wasn't going to last. But I guess it was 2018. At that point, I had readers going, Brie, Brie, this is the this is the real deal. They are serious. This is a good game. These are good devs. They're in for the long haul. They have the support of, you know, George Lucas's son. They're not going anywhere. You should give it a try. And I'm like, fine, I will. I haven't really logged out since. <laughs> no, I've, I felt that logging in. You just get a sense that they've got it. And I, and I don't think it started this way from what I can tell. There's an, they're very quite transparent on the uh, forums, there's a, a quite in-depth post about the history of the server. And I think it's taken a good few years for it to settle down into a state where they have processes in place and some kind of accountability for who's in charge yeah. and what people do. And, you know, it seems to me like if someone decides, right, to, to one day unplug the servers or to one day, I don't know, leak everyone's data and stuff, there would be repercussions for that. It's always a yeah. risk with, with something like this. You have to, you know, it's on you whether or not you risk it or not. But generally speaking, and I think a lot of it is to do with public, uh, pu- mm, it's to do with... Uh, I don't want to say marketing, publicity, PR, but that's some of it. No, that's it, you, fair. You know, they, have, it, they have a really good community outreach, definitely. Yeah, and it gives you a sense of security and a feeling of they kind of know what they're doing. These people. So, what were your early experiences of kind of when you jumped into that server? How did you get? How did you find your feet basically and get back on the Star Wars Galaxy's horse and, and get going again? With I've I've heard you say that a big kind of agenda was to re-equip your character and get back to where you were in the live game. So I guess that was a lot of it. Yeah, it it really was. I I played Star Wars Galaxies, especially at the end, as like a pure crafter kind of merchant type tune. So fleet really let's let's be honest everybody had like a million accounts by the end of the original game so you weren't playing one character you were playing a ton of characters and my main character was a chef and i had a smuggler and i had an armor smith and pretty much i did a little bit of dabbling in a lot of things and i ran a shop and i had beautiful houses i just i really liked the simulation of it all so when i started over on legends i was like well why would i do anything else than that that's what i liked doing back in the day that's what i still like now and now they're giving me the opportunity to do it I'm going to do it. So that's that's pretty much what I did. I started a chef. I got a bunch of crafters going. I rerolled my smuggler and got my level 90 to, you know, my my level 90 token on her and I have a bunch of Ithorians cuz Ithorians are the best. And I I set about, you know, not just setting up my shop and trying to make sure I had cap all the stuff I wanted to make, but also like totally recreating my original house from live in the main game. Mm. In the new game, I shouldn't call it the main game, the in legends. So it's not 100% there yet. I'm not really rich enough to pull it off. I had more money than than anybody should really have a right to in the old game. In this game, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working on it. 
So it's still, you see, that's different to me. Like, I kind of felt like this is a new start. I'm not going to try and do that. I was kind of, oh, I, I had a legend, I, I had a Jedi who I spent through the CU, not the original way you had to grind holocrons, but in the uh, CU version, which is like kind of the mid, I think of as the middle version of, of uh, Star Wars Galaxies in between the NGE and right. uh, the earlier game. I'll forget all about that. I'm not going to have a Jedi. I'm not going to live where I lived before. This is this is a new start, and I think some of it was to do with this idea of uh, it, living in the past. Oh, you see, I see. Yeah. You see, one of the things that people have said to me, uh, people from my guild back in the day, is that why are you playing this old game? Why are you living in the past? You need to move on, and you need to play something current and up to date. And I'm like. I'm not living in the past. Can't you see? If, if, you know, <laughs> exactly. they, they, they seem to think you should be moving on to something current. But if the current thing is not engaging you, then it is not offering what you want, then you're kind of going to go wherever that thing is. And it may be that it's in the past or it's in an old game, but that's not why I don't want to return to the past. <laughs> I'm playing it because it has all the things in it that I like. I don't know. Does any of that make know. sense? A hundred percent. I'm like right on board with you. I don't like it when people say that stuff like this is about nostalgia. It's like, no, nostalgia is when when you, you see something you used to like and then you try it out and you're like, oh, yeah, that's why I quit that or that's why that got closed down. I guess I'm done with that after all. And then you go back to whatever you're doing. It's not nostalgia when you go back to an old thing and you're like, damn, this is awesome and play it for two years straight. Nobody plays video games out of nostalgia. You might try a video game out of nostalgia but you don't stay in it especially not a world like absolutely this. It, not it just doesn't make any sense you wouldn't spend two years doing it and i've done it i've i i have been motivated by nostalgia i decided uh i'm gonna go back to well, what was it was one of the early ultimas like not Ultima Online, and not even before they became <laughs> like what we might call <laughs> isometric, like really right back to the beginning and thought that this will be great. I'll play through all these old games. And it's you can't because the systems, the things that we want from games are just not there anymore. It's, not, it's a nightmare. So I, I think nostalgia, once you act upon it, is very quickly, if that's the only thing that is motivating you, it's very quickly exposed as not really a solid foundation for, for returning to something. It's, it, exists, it exists as memory and exists as emotions, but in actuality, it's not what you think it is when you return to it. But something like something like Legends, it, it's kind of scratching an itch for me in the now that nothing else is scratching. And um, that's why I'm playing it anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, there are no real direct competitors for it. People are always emailing, asking, like, what do I play if I like this? Or what do I play if I like, you know, any of, any of the sandboxes for the ages or the games that used to be more sandboxy than they are now. It's like, well worm i mean it's not like there's mm. nothing it's just that it's like the choices are always they they feel like downgrades in some way they're not quite this the virtual world feel it's not the raf coster as sandbox is that people are really actually after so it doesn't it makes perfect sense to me that people would would play this and why new people play this why people who never played star wars galaxies are now playing legends because they wanted to see you know what what was all the fuss about and then some of them stay and that's that's also not nostalgia that's that's a lack of competition in the market a lack of anybody else serving this particular segment of the player base. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that's been most uh, unexpected for me doing the YouTube channel. The number of people who get in touch who are not nostalgic, bearded, 40-year-olds like me, right. they're, they're kind of young people. They are, they're people who are now only now in their mid twenties, and maybe they're aware of galaxies when they were like twelve or something, and they didn't. They all they didn't have access to their cre parents' credit card. They couldn't play it back then, but they always desperately wanted to play it. I've heard from so many people like that. Um, it's not all former players. It's people who missed the window and uh, and have always been curious. So you've got a, a much broader range of ages playing the game than. I expected. I, I, it's probably my limited imagination. I, I imagined everyone to be about my age who's playing the game, but it seems to me that the average age is something between like, I don't know, 24 and mid 30s or something like that. Um, certainly the, the, the teams that are working on it, the developers and the, uh, the kind of outreach team, the PR team and stuff seem to be in that age bracket. So that, that's, that's been a surprise to me. Was, was that something that surprised you at all? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would also think that they're old millennials or young Gen X, and they're almost always younger millennials, and it always blows my mind. I had this exact same experience with the City of Heroes emulation community yeah. when that blew up last year, and I kind of got embedded in, in a, their groups and everything, and I started realizing, oh my God, these are kids. I mean, they're not really kids. They're not like 10, you know what I mean? But they're yeah. like in their 20s and their early 30s, and I'm thinking – these guys were barely even old enough to play the game and now they're saving it again. And this is awesome. Like the preservation is coming from the bottom up instead of like the old farts that you would think, right. Would be yeah. using nostalgia to save games. They're not, it's actually coming from the bottom up. I I'm like, totally i find it so wholesome their attitude about preservation their attitude about saving things and you know, playing them who cares what the law says you know going right ahead and playing it anyway it's just like i don't know i'm i'm here for it yeah and on the law thing i kind of held off for a long long time waiting for something a little bit more stable and something that you know gives you a sense that as you said earlier the time that you invest is not going to be wasted and that definitely seems to be the case with legends and um, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> um, the next question I had for you, Bree, was Holy Grail items in Legends. Are there any items that you never had in life that you want to get again that are the things that are driving you to play? That I never had in life? Mm -hmm. I, mm, I don't think I ever had one of the Cloud City houses. But I don't think I really wanted one either. <laughs> maybe, maybe just because you know, Bespin is awesome. If I could have stuff that like one of the, I did have. Do you are you in legend? Are you meaning the like for the new the new expansion, or is there a Cloud City house like this? There was there was a Cloud City house. It was like up on a little um, like on a pedestal, and it was like floating. Holy! I know the pictures of it. That's the only reason I remember it exactly. I am oh, clearly cool. unaware of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hunt you down a picture after this, but I, those pictures I have of it are from the original live game. I think it was one of those things that got added really toward the end with, um, like they added the best bed cloud car. Oh, wow. They added that house. It's gorgeous, right? Yeah, it's, hang, it's, it's, it's literally hanging in, the, hanging in the sky. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> so I, I never have one of those. I'd really like to have my diner back. I know diners aren't in. Um, legends yet, but I had two diners on two different servers <laughs> live. I was really kind of a hardcore Star Wars Galaxies player. I had way, way too much stuff. I'd like to have that back. I want the, I think it was called the Marauder Bunker, not the bank bunker they give you when you first log into the game. It was like a small, like one room bunker that had like windows, which at the time was revolutionary. I know Legends has lots of windows and lots of houses now, but the time for the original game, that was a big deal. I loved that building. If I could get those, I'd, I'd be set. Also, I really want them to bring back... <laughs> Well, I'm asking for things, right? Yeah. <laughs> every every Christmas they bring out um, all of the Wookiee rewards, but I hardly ever see the bunting. And the bunting just keeps going up in price, and it's like one of my favorite <laughs> items in the game. So Legends developers, find a way to get the Wookiee bunting, the Life Day bunting, like in the game in a big way, because they're it's like the coolest object in the entire game. And I have like 20 of them, and I want more. So <laughs> I'm asking for things. Is it something that's already in the game and it kind of only comes around every now and again is that the yeah you only get it and you get it at random out of the gifts for life day oh okay and i didn't see a single one of them come up last life day like i started oh. to wonder if maybe they were bugged or if somebody was hoarding them i don't know but when i got to the game i bought all of them because i knew i knew every wall in my house needed to have them they're like you know like little fairy they're the equivalent of fairy lights for star wars Galaxy. i think i've got some i just assumed they were not quite that rare how much are they on the bazaar then Last time I checked, they were $4 million a piece. Oh, my God. I know. And equivalent stuff is like 10 k So it like there's something going on there with the, the, the drops of them. Or somebody's hoarding, and I don't know who it is. Do you it's not me. I'm hoarding a small amount. But not <laughs> I was just thinking if you were on the massively OP at this point, I'm not sure you could ask for Wookiee Bunting and not expect <laughs> 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 somebody to pick you up on it. But this is a no, safe, no, this is a safe space where you can talk about Wookiee Bunting and cloud houses all you like. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of other stuff, though. If Like, I was sitting there thinking the other day, like, what would I change about the game? And I actually started making a list. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'm not running for Senate. I don't want to be a game dev. Oh, I'm that's great. No, that. I'd love to hear that. I want the auction hall completely revamped from the ground up. I want the entire organization system 
you know what I mean? Like the searching function and like oh, which yeah. way everything is categorized. Like, mm -hmm. why the heck is it 2020 and all the factory boxes for every item in the entire game are in one category? Tell me that makes sense. That does not make sense, fam. So I, I like I think of the game sometimes and I go, you know, this is really broken and it's been broken for almost 20 years. I wonder if I can fix that. And then I go, no, 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 you have a job. <laughs> what are you doing? Let the, <laughs> let the professionals handle this. And so I never do it. But. but this is another indication of why I think the team on Legends is quite, quite savvy. Like, okay, next update for Star Wars Galaxies Legends. We've revamped the auction hall. <laughs> okay. Wait, what, really? No, no, no. That, oh, okay. Imagine imagine that that is the new, that is the latest update. How many eyeballs or new players do you think that is going to bring into the game? It's like, I don't know. They are, re they are really, Zero, none. they are really good at focusing on like, how do we get, how, how do we do stuff that gets a buzz around it? You know what I mean? I'd love like, like those quality of life changes, like the bazaar, those changes you mentioned. I also, I also really, people would kick back against this, but I really like the days when you didn't have a global, um, indication of everything in the galaxy you know i like the idea of those local markets so you had to move around and find where you know something might be five million here but if you go to bestine it's two million kind of thing um mm -hmm. you know? I, I feel like that would just privilege people like me because then all you really need to do is like be really well known and people will just come straight to your vendor instead of shopping and buying from people who might be making better stuff for less money but you never know that that flow of information is really important to making sure that a couple of crafters can't dominate a whole the whole economy. I guess so. I was reading that one of Rask Graf Costa's breakdowns about it, about kind of local, um, the, the ability for local people and to have local economies that kind of add diversity and have people moving around so that, you know, you know there are hard caps on numbers in the game. So if you are the strongest, well, not the strongest, the, the, the best person at that particular thing, and you have a, like a global snapshot of everything, then that person is always going to be at the top. And there's no way to kind of knock them off the top. Whereas if it's if it's kind of locally, well, maybe on that market you don't have a chance, but over there you might, kind of thing. I don't know. No, I mean I I understand what he's what he's getting at, what you're getting at, because I like the idea of it too. The idea of you know moving goods even between planets as like gameplay, right? I mean that mm -hmm. sounds that's cool. really cool. If you're weirdos like us, right? If mm -hmm. you're crafters and merchants, that sounds cool. I've seen it go really wrong. That's all I'm trying to say. I saw it go really wrong in Ultima Online because what would end up happening is instead of people shopping around in different local markets, everybody with money went to one city and everybody who was anybody had a vendor in that city and right. nobody even bothered leaving that city. And it was it's what would happen in Star Wars Galaxies. People would just go, oh, well, it's going to be that one city on Tatooine. Everybody's going to go there. There's no point in even shopping around because they'll have everything. And we, okay. we already kind of see that with Mos Eisley, right? Like even just the bazaar, which is local. Almost nobody puts anything up anywhere but Mos Eisley because they know that's where everybody's shopping. So I feel like the, the intention is good. The idea is good. But I haven't seen anybody implement it in a way that wouldn't just suck <laughs> i hadn't thought of that like the idea is that it, even if even with that system in place it tends towards the solution that's in in place anyway it's kind of yeah everyone just goes to the one location um, but that's but that's not always the case. It's not the case when you can go in the auction hall, see who's got the best price, and you're like, well, I got five minutes. I'll run out to Talus. No big deal. I'll hit the Imperial Outpost, right? Do my little hop over. Not a big deal. It's just as fast as if I went to my favorite spot, even though they're more expensive on Dantooine, whatever. And ultimately, Ultima Online learned this lesson. Ultima Online also being one of Raph Coster's old games. They, they did go ahead, and they basically copied the Star Wars Galaxy system after the fact and said no we're going to have a, a bizarre a vendor search basically that's completely global and like it changed the makeup of that whole city overnight suddenly you didn't have to have a vendor there suddenly you didn't have to go there to shop just to find anything you could just do searches and that's just i'd much rather see that i think that just works better for making sure that again people like me don't win the game and everybody else is screwed yeah, I mean, I, a lot of the time when I'm crafting, because I have to cap out at a certain point when I see the spreadsheets that you're doing and the fleet of 
harvesters and factories <laughs> that you talk about. I I, I I I tap out at like about five factories, three harvesters. That's enough for me. And at that, if I go much above that, I just feel like I'm. It's work. It's too much like work for me. It is. It is work. You're not wrong. <laughs> but but um, yeah. So. Uh, I was thinking about the TEF system as well while we're talking while we're disagreeing about Ooh, bizarre yes. things because I think <laughs> I think you are a big fan of that system. Am I right? I am. All right, then. Do you want me to tell you why? <laughs> I would like you to step to, up to the podium and tell tell me why the TEF system is so great. So basically, it boils down to accepting that some players hold on, do not hold want on. to be involved in. Sorry, Bree. We're talking in shorthand. Probably there are people watching who don't know what the hell a TEF is. So I should say, okay, so in Star Wars Galaxies, before they um, locked in the PvP to kind of more arena specific areas uh, and obvious distinctions between factions, there was a more malleable system in place called TEF, which was temporary enemy flags. Uh, it's not exclusive to Galaxies, uh, that kind of system, but that's what the system was called within Galaxies. And it allowed for a kind it was basically raf costa's attempt to um not ruin another game yeah okay but also <laughs> but also he God said knows i love him it's fine he says that um the the intention was to create a system that allowed for all the different factional scenarios in star wars yes. so you see luke skywalker in stormtrooper armor he's undercover at one point but then he um, he a battle erupts around him, and you see people in disguise all the time in Star Wars, and it's quite uh, this is quite fluid. So this system allowed people to kind of be undercover or be declared in the army, and so on, and they could switch between those systems, and sometimes on the fly. So did I did I do that okay? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd add it, I'd add to it that it also had complete neutrality. So if you really wanted no part of this, yes, you know the crazy the crazy kids in the cantina shooting each other, you could just stay completely neutral and stay out of it. <laughs> so yes, that was. I feel like that's really important because when you basically tell people that they have that kind of choice, what you have done is bring together like three different groups of player players of MMO players who would normally have nothing in common, don't want to cooperate, don't want to work together, don't even want to be in the same game. Right. You're bringing mm -hmm. together people who do not want to PVP at all. You're bringing together people who want to PVP, but on their own terms. And then you're bringing together people who are like, yeah, kill everybody. Woo. I'm running around as a stormtrooper all day long, <laughs> shooting everything I see. Right. You bring all of those people together in the same community, in the same game, in many cases, working on the same goal. On top of that, you've got now scenarios where, as you were pointing out, people could join like somebody would start something in, in the starport in front of Theed, right and then suddenly it would flare up because people who were formerly you know like they were uh, what do they call it off duty not off duty what is it called uh what um, did it used to be called i don't know covert was it covert, covert? yes it was yeah, covert you're covert. absolutely right so like suddenly all these people you thought were neutral suddenly start popping their flags and it's a war just bam it like flashes over and all of these people who thought well i don't really want to pvp all the time are like well i'll pvp right now because there's a war right here and this is going to be awesome and i saw that i saw that for for so long and it was just it was the most fun PvP. It really, truly was. And I, I say that as somebody who really, really liked PvP. I was a big UO PvP, or I PvP'd a ton in World of Warcraft, and I've kind of done everything from the gank box to the, you know, super faction locked stuff. This was this was the best middle ground I can think of that actually inspired lots of people to play together. Instead of just dividing people up between PvP and PvE servers, roleplay servers, whatever. I I just loved it. It, it was a stroke of brilliance, and more more games need it. Okay, I can, I get that. I and I love the idea, the theory behind it. I love I love what Raf Costa was trying to achieve, and that what you've just outlined sounds fantastic. But my experience of the of the TF system was, was some Imperial running around with no, an ATRT and no, no, just blowing everybody up. Oh, it, it was different. something different. It led to a kind of a uh, a kind of a nefarious or. Um, underhanded approach to PvP. So for instance, uh, you would go to Anchorhead and... Uh, oh, Anchorhead is a corner case. Because <laughs> Anchorhead was like always a war zone. Everybody there was messing with you. Yeah. I love so, that. <laughs> so, you, so you couldn't see really, okay, a, a fun Star Wars battle is the Stormtroopers are there. Um, the Rebels are here. 
then they have a big flashy fight. But in actuality, what seemed to happen a lot of the time was you wander into an area and you see all these blue dots on your radar. And some of those people may be neutral. Some of those people may be covert. Um, and it, re remember, it only took one person who was covert to attack a stormtrooper. Am I right about this, Bree? Yeah, no, you can you're right. attack an NPC stormtrooper, then you're suddenly declared and you the can be, flag, right. be attacked by players or NPCs at that stage. So it, it kind of led to this situation where everyone was undercover until some <laughs> sucker came into the middle who you knew was a rebel who maybe thought he was safe or something. Then everyone around him suddenly declared and pounced on him, which is kind of like... It, it was people trying to trick people into, you know, getting the drop on them rather than it being a, a, a clear fight, a pitched battle. People would kind of use the mechanics of the system to trip people up. And that was the aspect of it that I felt was, although I like the idea, I, I like the idea of it, but it's, it's kind of like what you were saying with the bizarre, the actual, the intention is good, but in actuality, people exploit and try and trick people. And that was kind of off-putting to me because I wasn't sure when I went into an area, you know, am I am I going into a combat zone here? Am I safe? Am I not safe? And I think particularly for people just starting in the game, it's very off-putting when think, yeah. you have a very complicated system that somebody else understands the very intricate rules surrounding it. And you just feel like, well... There's nothing I can do here because I don't understand how I was killed in that particular situation, why it was allowed and how it happened. Um, d that's why I have kind of reservations about it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, no. I, I see exactly what you're saying. It was definitely confusing. If you went into the game as like a newbie and didn't do like research, because let's be honest, all MMOs that old required you to research what was going on. But if you didn't and then you flagged if you if you picked a side if you picked a faction and didn't stay neutral you were probably going to get your butt handed to you several times before you figured out like you said the intricacies of the rules and who's really on what side and who's just lying in wait but in reality i feel like that's that was part of the fun like part of the amusement factor like you really needed to be careful before you picked a fight that's something that's missing from a lot of gank boxes that's what i call them the you know the games where it's just a free for all all the time and there are very few consequences for killing people willy nilly that's not what star wars was supposed to be about you weren't supposed to be able to just start opening fire on stormtroopers in in mos eisley and just get away with it no there were going to be civilians who were secretly you know imperials who were going to rat you out and tell the, the stormtroopers where you were and they're you know I'm seeing and there are going to be rebels who are hanging out going uh-uh we're going to fight back mm. and you don't know who everybody is you don't know so be careful don't just assume that that lone stormtrooper is you know an easy target even if he is intentionally trying to lure you out maybe just don't start don't start a fight until you've got backup you know this is this is like the old west only in unlike the old west you can choose not to participate at all like even if you're covert Nobody made you attack that stormtrooper in the first place. But there were definitely like other little exploits around it. The one I mentioned was when people had the little, I think they're called ATRTs or ATSTs, the little ones. And people would go around and just abuse the crap out of that. People would do things like throw down the the big installations and like lag the crap out of the server and you know, farm stuff. And there was, there was definitely some problems with it, but TEF itself, I think was a good system. Definitely needed better communication to players so that they understand, Oh, that NPC is an Imperial. I shouldn't attack it even because like, if you don't know the lore, you're not even going to necessarily know who's good. Like who's on which side. It's not always clear. Mm. <laughs> and that that's, that's like the game tricking you just by virtue of not, you know, you're not necessarily being super in on star Wars. But yeah, I think overall, I think it was a pretty good system, and I'd like to see it like brought into the into the modern, you know, modern game design because nobody's really doing that. Most of the games are like blocking everybody off into arenas or battlegrounds or whatever, or it's they don't have PvP at all, or it's like all open PvP with very few rules, and they're all kind of yeah, they're just they're just separating everybody, and that's the opposite of what MMOs should be doing. I know, and philosophically, I want to agree. But I have this kind of sense. <laughs> I, I have this feeling. I would love that to be the case, but it, but uh, that that it were possible to find a system within which the rules maybe are a little bit murky, but it feels fair. But 
like there are so many edge cases that kind of uh, that spread exponentially with an essentially complicated system that once it becomes you know multiplayer and there are so many people doing so many things it's like essentially the, the, uh, this is this is Just too stop shooting at people and this is, is this is too broad <laughs> <laughs> this is kidding. too too broad a thing but like game essentially a game should be simple but th within that simplicity there are com you know it, yes, it can yes. get very very complicated and i think the tef system starts too complicated and then gets more complicated. <laughs> it's like, oh no, you're right. That, that's it, a really good like point. It's like chess. Chess is very, very simple. They, you know, but ultimately it can be infinitely complex. And uh, uh, and uh, that's where I'm coming from. And and kind of, I would I would love I would love games to reflect the intricacy of life, but. I don't think it's possible and games need rules. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I was thinking about it the other day and thinking uh, this might be a dark age of Camelot solution where you have like uh, safe zones that are faction specific. So you have rebels here, Imperials here. They can't enter each other's zones, but there's this kind of liminal zone in the middle where everyone can go and cross over and they know those are strict boundaries territories um, physical borders and once you cross that border it's it's a clear indication now I'm at risk and you can it's kind of a, a a clearer decision but like you say it doesn't it doesn't allow for those more kind of the organic spring uh, of of yeah the and those yeah. people who are less inclined maybe those people who like you were saying would in that case, well, I'm just never going to cross that border then because yeah. I'm never willing to do that. And yeah, you kind of lock those people out. So I, I kind of, yeah, I do get where you're coming from totally. No, no, it just ends up becoming kind of a side game, like a mini game instead of like one of the things that was supposed to be driving like conflict and cooperation in the game. And yeah, it's, it's, you're not, you're not wrong. Everybody really should have been like forced to stay in neutral until they could like go through the test and prove they understood how the faction system worked because it was complicated is totally totally and in, and in the early days they were weird they they patched this out eventually but stuff like you know passing someone an item would get you flagged oh you yeah know? or buff like healing in the cantina it was a real mess for even for entertainer mm. or doctors <laughs> No, you got you got to go covert. You can't be overt, or I can't heal you. That kind of stuff, or yeah. or the whole place would erupt. And yeah, that was kind of you know you're in a group with people who are some are covert, some are neutral, some are declared or whatever. What happens when one person within that group gets attacked? Does the whole group get flagged? And uh, yeah, well, I have a I have a question here that is far too broad really for anyone to answer, but it's just a talking point really kind of I've heard you and Justin talk over the years many times and your readers are kind of always asking this question but about the everything box you know the sandbox and stuff oh, and yeah. how how uh, MMO development has kind of changed over the years from this um, more open design to a more codified system um, I guess because of the success of things like WoW and whatnot but I did want to just pick your brains about I think you're in a very unique position. You you can see from many different angles and have a, a much better sense than, some, than someone like me about the direction things could be going and stuff. And do you think like sandbox gameplay, everything box, the stuff like Star Wars Galaxies really is a thing of the past or is it something that you might see come back at some point? MMORPG sandboxes, they're at least they're on pause. I don't think that they're gone forever. I don't think that we'll never see a new one. But I, I definitely think we haven't seen a new one, a really good one in a long time. Nobody's really trying to do what Raf Koster was trying to do. Although Raf Koster is trying to do what Raf Koster is trying to do. We can talk about that later. Yeah. But like a, a lot of the gameplay in MMOs has been funneled out. Um, it was it was Ted Costanova who said they he called it the unbundling. I love this. I talk about this all the time because it's such a perfect word to describe what's happened to our genre, right? It isn't just that wow, well, like theme parks took over. That did happen, but it's also that a lot of the things that MMOs were you know considering their domain have spun out into other genres, like mm -hmm. from MOBAs and 
even even battle royales, that kind of stuff, all different genres that can do it better because they're only doing one thing. They're only trying to do one thing. And it's kind of left MMOs or what's left of them, not just without a lot of money to reinvest in themselves, but also without a whole lot of fresh ideas because even they're not even doing the thing that they used to do well, the best. That So there's not a whole lot of like pull for people to play, you know, PVP in an MMO over say Fortnite. Mm -hmm. Especially when Fortnite is trying to do stuff like add in content, like add in social content. Like they're they're almost coming at it from a different angle instead of starting with social and like adding combat, adding different kinds of mini games. They're like, "No, we added this one gameplay style on top of a sandbox." But you know what I mean? And now we're bringing in concerts, now we're bringing in events and social, you know, social kinds of activities and things like that to the point where, you know, pundits are calling it a metaverse and you're thinking Fortnite is a metaverse. Are you (laughs) kidding me? What happened to MMORPGs? Like, did you guys miss second life? But you know what I mean? This, this is like a thing that's going on this week. I don't know when you're publishing this, but this is just a conversation that's kind of been rolling through our offices and rolling through the community this week. This idea that Fortnite is becoming the sandbox we always wanted, but it's really not, it doesn't feel anything like, what MMORPG players are, are after. I, I guess I think the whole thing is is cyclical. I think it'll come back around again. I think as the tech kind of advances, like this is something Raf Koster has said before, he's actually working on a new sandbox and he's talked about how the things that they wanted to do in the late 90s in MMOs, you couldn't do, like technically not possible. In 2020, totally technically possible, but the will and the money aren't there. Uh-huh. So when the developers decide, well, maybe this, maybe it's time for these kinds of games to get a revival, the will and the money will be there. So that's that's kind of what I'm personally waiting for and why I'm biding time in old games until that happens again. I, I do think it will. I suppose the question occurred to me when I was thinking about some of these games and how they came about, the kind of environment when they were developed, which was a much more exploratory time and a kind of a, a time of test, oh, yes. testing ideas. And let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. And whether that was just a product of its time, whether those design ideas have ultimately been proved to not work. You know, they don't work and we won't see a return to the kind of, uh, it's, it's used too much like the innovative innovative game design or whatever. It, I don't think that is quite right. It was just because at that particular time, these people were exploring and didn't know the answers and hadn't got the data to show what works and what doesn't work. So they were just trying all these different ideas. And whether that is something that it's just not viable to go back to now and maybe maybe that kind of exploration and that innovation is is precisely that it, and it happens only when something is first uh is first being muted and being explored um and whether whether those design ideas really they didn't latch on because they don't have the kind of legs of something, the kind of more codified gameplay of something like, wow, that's what works. This other stuff doesn't work. There's not a critical mass of people who will put up with the, the inherent, say, downtime of something like a sandbox or um, the, the the woolly systems that take some understanding, like the TEFs that we've talked about. <laughs> they kind of, they've been ironed out over time because... They're just too complicated, you know. I it, it's it's that. Am I being too negative in my idea of? Well, those were things that were muted, tried, didn't work, and this is what works. Um, or is it something that people will return to and try again? I I hope so. Like when I hear what Raf is trying to do with his new game, I I I get excited. Um, but I hope I hope it's I'm not I hope it's not a, a crazy mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it is a crazy mess because really that just describes sandboxes. The best sandboxes are all crazy messes. Let's be honest. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if what we need is a, is a, is a sandbox that is not a crazy mess to prove <laughs> to prove ultimately that sandboxes can be really, really solid, really, really great. They're still sandboxes, but they're not a crazy mess. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Now, I think that. Looking at especially the period when Star Wars Galaxies originally came out, we're talking about 2003 here. There was a couple of years from like 2003 to like 2005 when like every game that came out 
was really different. It was like not just different from what had come before, but was different from the other games that were coming out next door. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I, I, even down to like control scheme. You know, yes. imagine having to learn a new control scheme for a new game <laughs> every no, time you start exactly a new game. It. It's everything. Everything from controls to what what the graphics look like to what people expected out of the leveling experience to what people expected out of the cosmetic experience or you know the the character development. Everything was different. Eve was different from Star Wars Galaxies. Was different from uh, what was the Rizom? Do you guys remember Rizom? Oh and yeah. Then, and wow, and Guild Wars and all those games. The only thing they have in common is that they were some of the best games that the MMORPG industry ever produced because all of those developers were like, hell yeah, let's get us some of that EverQuest money, right? Mm. And so they were like, how are we going to do something that isn't just EverQuest? And so they all went off in their own directions and made something completely different. And then wow happened. And, mm -hmm. then, and that came to kind of an end. And then there was a very different, everything looked very different after World of Warcraft or like after the first couple of years of World of Warcraft and it became really clear that was going to be the dominant um, you know, fork in the road for MMOs. And I think you're right that it's really hard to recreate that magic. That That's probably never going to happen again exactly the same way. Everybody knows stuff now and there are no, you know, the, the fledgling developers out there in the world are not ignorant of 20 years. Well, they shouldn't be ignorant of 20 years of MMO development history. They have all of this baggage in a good way and a bad way to, to draw from when they're, when they're trying to make a new game. They're probably, probably not going to make all the mistakes, but they're also not going to make some of the crazy, you know, innovative ideas happen. They're not even going to try it because not just because they know it didn't, it failed because in many cases it didn't fail. Those were really great ideas. They just didn't win compared to something like, wow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're, they're just, they're, the money isn't there. Or I've talked about this a lot in, in terms of brain drain, brain drain for the industry. Like we're losing devs, older devs who are here, they're retiring, they're passing away. And at the bottom end, new developers with fresh ideas are not bringing them to the MMORPG genre. So we're losing devs at both ends. That's not really good for innovation either. No. At the same time, people love the holodeck. And MMOs are really just the holodeck. And there's no way, no way in a, in a million years that people are going to be like, oh, yeah, forget the holodeck. Let's play some Fortnite. Not going to happen. No. When MMOs get to holodeck levels, they've won the game. Yeah, that is basically still the dream. It's kind of a game that is as complex as life, that has as many, uh, gives you as many options yeah, and and gives you the ability to live an alternate life, you know, the kind of second life thing, and that that desire will always be there. It's interesting to think how it might pan out in the future and how how it might come about. Uh, I I keep thinking about VR and stuff, and maybe that is the space in which there'll be innovation. But it's such a limited. Um, it seems so limited at the minute. Like there's yeah. nothing. There's nothing like kind of living an alternate life in a, in a VR game. They are, <laughs> they're kind of mostly just experiences or very uh, closed down, linear um, gameplay at the moment. But right. I'm always kind of thinking, what is the space? Because ultimately, like, you never really know where – you can never you can never know where the new thing is going to spring from in whatever you're talking about. It's like if we knew – if people knew we would, where the we would next, have invested our money yeah, into it already. Right? You know, it, so kind of looking for I'm not sure if it's if it's really the right approach to kind of be looking for a return to sandboxes or um a, a new or or a new type of MMORPG. Maybe you need to be looking completely somewhere else for where the where that's gonna come from and it'll spring from an a, an unexpected direction. But um, it's just interesting to think about. It feels sometimes as an MMORPG fan, um, it feels like you're kind of uh, you hitched your wagon to a uh, a genre that changed direction quite dramatically at a certain point. Yes. It's like being a member of a political party that changes its ethos and changes its focus. And done you, that too. <laughs> yeah, and you still remember the thing that you joined for and the thing that you hoped for. So it's it's kind of, I'm always looking for that and, and thinking, yeah, maybe we'll return to that at some point. I don't necessarily think it's going to be VR. I, I guess I just wanted to 
stick that in there because that's not really what I meant, what I mean by when I say holodeck anyway. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm thinking about just the virtual world experience, not necessarily like actually being a hologram or like going into a hologram simulator. No, no, I like get that. The experience yeah. of virtual world. That's something very few people are making in, in a kind of holistic way. Everybody who's making anything even a little bit like that, there's something off about it. Like they're not trying to make a complete simulation of anything. They're just taking like little chunks and little bits that will appeal to the, the market that they're going for. And that's, I'm looking for something that's, you know, that's going to, again, attract a lot of people, attract a lot of different types of people to play all together. That's that's what I see as like the point of MMOs. And that's what Coster said he saw as the point of MMOs. So that, that's kind of where I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that's right. That's the kind of way that you would get that diverse diversity to of, of players that might start to reflect. If the systems are in place, a diverse range of people within that space will make it feel like an alternate world that you're describing, a kind of virtual simulation. But you can't do that with just people who want to kill each other. Um, you know, yes, and take yes, part in that's PvP. Exactly yeah, yeah. Even the sandboxes, we do get their they're, they're murder sims, right? You're a murder hobo. That's your that's your job in the game. And it's those rare games out there that actually allow you to do something else at all, let alone as like do something else as your main occupation. How many MMOs out there allow you to be a chef full time without doing something else? It's like, I can count them on one hand, guys. That's crazy. The genre is 23, at least 23 years old. How did that happen? How is everything about this one slice of gameplay? Why did that win? What's wrong with humans? That this is the thing that keeps winning, right? I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is about multiplayer that makes that happen. But if you look at something like The Sims, how is that like the most one of the most popular games in the world? And there's no fighting in that. Well, mock fighting. <laughs> Say again. Sorry, you cut out. Pool ladders. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Oh my gosh! No, like pool ladders. Like when you take your ladder out of the pool, so you oh swim. yeah, and they swim and die for it. Yeah, yeah. First thing people do when they get in this. People are messed up, man. <laughs> okay, but you know, it's a sim. What I was trying to say was, it was a simulation um, of everyday life where you get married, have kids, fall in love, and it's huge. Why is there not the equivalent of that? Um, a multiplayer version of that? I know they tried. Um, uh, yeah, like it really bad. It didn't really have anything in common with the original game, like. It, it just it sucked it wasn't really about building it wasn't really about a simulation it was about grinding and it was just it was terrible it i wish they could start over i wish they could come up with something i i know that the next sims game is probably going to be more online than ever that's the rumor anyway but is it going to be an mmo eh, probably not it kind of proves there is a desire a mass a huge desire for games that are beyond just murdering people it's in a, in the single player space but it's one of the most popular franchises in the world so the desire is there to do stuff other than murder people and so i don't know why mmos keep going back to this i suppose it's a risk and there's precedent now they've tried it once before with the actual sims and that didn't work so the assumption is it just doesn't work in a multiplayer space but if people in single player are happy with just going and doing their jobs in the sims and cooking and stuff I don't know why they wouldn't want to do that with other people. Uh, I don't know. Right. And some people do. Some people, you know, like me, like you, go into these games and that's what we're doing. But that's really hard to monetize. That's really hard to implement, you know, in a, in a satisfying, fulfilling way. Now you have to monitor an economy. Now you have to, like, like all of the systems in a good sandbox should, should integrate. There should be synergy with everything going on. You can't just add another thing without it affecting everything else. If you stick to basic, like, beating people up if you know killing stuff that's so much easier to actually build and then sell like literally to break it down into chunks here's the here's the next map and here's the next dungeon and here's how grouping works that stuff is something that's just easy to process i don't want to say easy to develop like as if game development is easy it's not it's just easier than trying to develop a functioning economy in a simulator that anybody would want to play mm -hmm. well Maybe one day we'll have a decent version of The Sims Online. Did you? Did you act? I, because I was aware of it, but I never managed to get in. All I can remember were reports. Maybe it was even massively talking about it, where there was kind of a game where four players would get together and all make a pizza together and stuff like that. I never saw pizzas. <laughs> I, I remember playing. I remember like standing around in rooms 
um, like standing desks and everybody would get into these rooms and everybody was like typing because we were all grinding a typing skill maybe. I'm not sure. I remember there was a lot of like um, unsavory elements in the game and like oh, a lot no. of places where you could go uh, were sort of like the red light district of the game. And it was yeah. just it, Thing was a mess and it, it only took a couple weeks to become a mess and it had nothing in common with the sims by that point <laughs> oh god i forgot all about that that's I one of the reasons is... so, much. so crazy <laughs> yeah because as soon as you go into a server you suddenly have to take away tools from this that the single player is used to because you can't give them that kind of freedom or you just get penis shaped houses all over the map <laughs> yeah well they couldn't even do that they couldn't even make penis shaped houses that's that's a tragedy, man. <laughs> At least you can go into a survival sandbox and do that, right? Yeah, yeah, you can, can't you? There, yeah, Minecraft. Yeah, what, what, what Minecraft allows you to do that, but yeah. it's a very blocky I penis in that case, and maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's not as not quite as shocking as people as to people. So, Bree, with your awesome perspective over the entire industry and everything that is happening in the world of MMOs. I'm not putting too much pressure on you. But no, what, sure. <laughs> what what companies and people should be we be watching in the MMO RPG space at this point? I'd love to get your perspective on that. You know, I'm gonna say Raf Coster because yay! If you're, if you're a Star Wars Galaxies fan, and you are, or you wouldn't be listening to Nap's podcast. Then you know you know that he's he and his wife, especially, and the the team that's around him, they have an idea for MMORPGs, especially for sandboxes and virtual worlds. It's so different from what everybody else is making, and it's always been real different from Ultima to Star Wars Galaxies to what was it Meat Place? Well, he's made some crazy stuff. This is what I'm trying to say. Meta Place, and, wasn't it? Meta Place. Thank you. Meat. What did you say? Meat Place. Meat place. Meat place. <laughs> the butcher, the game of butchery. All wise and all knowing, and I just called it meat place. But yes. <laughs> but you know, he he consulted on Growfall, and now he has got his own studio again, and he's working on his own game, and he is doing stuff that sounds like stuff I want to play. Mm-hmm. That 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 has me. I mean, we're years years away from anything like playable. So. Don't get too excited, but know that somebody who actually cares about the genre is working on this. That that excites me because, yeah, we, we really need that. Almost all of the old school devs at this point have come back and, like, tried to, like, recreate the golden days, right? Yeah, yeah. But they're all making really different ones, everything from Pantheon to Camelot and whatnot. So his is going to be even more different. His is going to be more like a return to the glory days of sandboxes, of the kind of sandboxes people listening to this are going to be interested in. That excites me. And like I said, he also worked on Crowfall. Crowfall has my attention. To be fair, I backed this on Kickstarter like a million years ago, but it has my attention, even though it's primarily a PVP game, because of who's you know who's been working on it. If, if you guys know, Thomas Blair actually worked on Star Wars Galaxies for years and is responsible for a lot of the like the salvage work that happened post NGE on Star Wars Galaxy. That's right. a lot of the reason. Yeah, a lot of the reason I I liked the game at that point. I didn't realize at the time that it was him, but I know now in, in retrospect, oh yeah, he was he was the what do they call him the uh, design lead at the time. So y- okay. yeah, he to see him like working on another another game that has like a lot of sandboxy elements, a lot of crafting, the same similar kinds of harvesting, you know, he they didn't neglect it. Just because it's a PvP game doesn't mean they neglected the economy. That excites me. I really fall. I'm a fangirl for his work. What can I say? So definitely pay attention to Crowfall. That one just hit alpha. So that's probably like the closest to actual fruition of anything I'm going to mention. Obviously, if you're a sci-fi fan, you got to be watching Star Citizen. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Even if even if you think the monetization of Star Citizen is crap and you're not really interested in, you know, 10 million years of testing, the game is spectacular. It looks spectacular on paper. The design is spectacular. It could be an amazing sci-fi simulation if it ever gets finished. Obviously, you you have to be watching that. Well, stages, um, it, 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 Star Citizen, you can kind of go in. Can you can you you can fly some of the ships now? You can walk around and stuff. You can visit your hangar. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's there's an element of PvP in the game. It's it's kind of chunky. Like parts are missing, large systems are missing, large destinations are missing. It's not finished. It is definitely an alpha. When they say it's an alpha, it's an alpha. Mm. On the other hand, it's an alpha that's kind of playable. Like and people do. So 
it's the same as Crowfall. It's a, exactly the same kind of, actually, I'd say Crowfall is significantly further along. When they say alpha, they, they don't mean quite the same kind of alpha. The systems are changing. They're still building on it. Those are, but that's what I'm saying. Those are, those are games coming out in the next, you know, couple of years. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> that I think people listening to your podcast would be interested in that are actually doing interesting things in the MMO genre. And the last one I want to mention is Pearl Abyss, because we know they have a whole bunch of games coming up. Pearl Abyss is the, the Korean company that made Black Desert mm -hmm. and it's it so well, including in the United States um, and made a lot of money. And it's kind of a sandbox. It's like a pseudo sandbox. And then they bought CCP which is making, which of course runs EVE Online. So they're like, they're in the sandbox land is what I'm saying. And then they're working on several other MMOs and they're pitching MMOs to the MMORPG market in the United States, in the West, in Europe. That's really unusual. <laughs> like almost none of the major AAA companies in the West are doing that. So pay attention to them because they're actually looking at us as their, their next market. I, I, I always watch what they do. I'm always interested in, you know, where they're going and whether any of those games pans out. Because Black Desert has been like, I mean, that's the most recent MMORPG hit in memory. I'm not really an EVE expert, but if, if you are interested in EVE, you should definitely check out Brendan Drain's work on Mazda OP. He actually just wrote a piece that touches on some of the huge changes that have been put into EVE most recently. And the concurrency is like really high and people really love the changes compared to last year so if you are an eve player definitely check that out there's a lot of neat things happening in old games i guess that's the other thing and that's maybe another thing worth touching on a lot of the interesting things happening in the mmo space are not happening in games that aren't here yet they're happening in games that are considered old or are considered at least dated in some way mm -hmm. and i don't think we're discounting them they're doing interesting interesting things um for example elder scrolls online just came out with a huge expansion uh, they call them chapters that has an exploration component like they call it it's the the uh, antiquity system where mm -hmm. it's literally nothing but exploring the world and hunting for antiquities that fit into all kinds of different niches in in the game from cosmetics to housing to combat that's really unusual. You know, we were talking about how you couldn't monetize non-combat content. That's an example where they kind of just did. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? By putting that in there, that brings a whole new player base to the game that's interested in doing that kind of content. That's really interesting. That's something we should all be paying attention to because it is totally doable. Yeah, totally. I mean, an exploration system is is kind of something for me that is a holy grail in MMOs, like um, when Star Trek Online came out and they had a, a an exploration system, which was very lackluster and kind of, you, you know, but the idea of an MMO that allowed you to endlessly explore, I, I guess the, uh, the closest thing are survival games and um, procedural generation, things like Minecraft. But yeah, that's an exciting idea. And repurposing existing content and layering on a new system kind of, it seems like a smart move, doesn't it? Absolutely. Excellent. Oh, that's great. I feel really guilty. I feel like I've just, um, rather than actually uh, researching this stuff, I can just talk to you. You just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me what's going on. Uh, but I really appreciate it. It's great. Okay. Well, I could ask this question that um, an observation I've had. So, it, so it's been a long time. Um, I, I've been doing YouTube a long time and I'm only kind of now getting to the point where if I po post a video, I hear from people about that video um, and get a sense of who's watching. I am getting information about the types of things people do in specifically Legends. And it seems to me a lot of the people I talk to find it difficult to actually find groups and group up with people and do multiplayer things in this multiplayer game. By extension, I feel like a lot of people play multiplayer games, MMOs, alone do you have a feeling that that is happening kind of most people play alone the majority of the time um it seems Going like together, right? yeah is that true true i'm gonna say true on that one because i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing i know there are going to be people out there who are you know really going to be angry about this but i don't because i think that reflects like physical reality too you are not doing everything in your real life with a group all the time right mm. you, there are going to be times when you're eating by yourself you're playing a video game by yourself you're reading a book by yourself not a group activity you know you're sleeping you're, maybe you're sleeping next to somebody but you're you're sleeping on you know what i'm saying you're sleeping alone you're going shopping you're not going in a giant pack of people most activities that humans do do not necessarily require 
bunch of people to actually conduct them, even if they're all socially connected. They're not necessarily like all doing it at the same time and working as a team. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes you're just hanging out at the mall watching people go by. You're in a social situation, but you're not actively being like, you know, actively talking or cooperating in any way. You're just being there like MMO players just being in a chat, even though they're not grouped with you and they're not, you know, out hunting crate dragons with you or whatever. So I don't I don't think it's a bad thing, except if the game is tooled around, you know, this the social experience. Star Wars Galaxy is, is definitely less social than it used to be. And I don't think anybody, like even pro post NGE people are, are probably going to agree with that, that it's very different from the days of everybody's piled into the cantina for buffs and for wound healing and for medic, you know, um, the, the healing that, that, you know what I mean, the healing that medics did, doctors did. It's different now. Like even the buffers are often AFK. Mm. Even the samplers are in a huge herd of people AFK. <laughs> so... Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't want to say like it's a bad thing, but I, I do think you're right. Except when I go to Mos Eisley and I see all these people who are putting together heroic groups and then I go to the Discord and all these people are like chit chatting all day long and I'm thinking, well maybe maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the one that needs to get into joining and they're not you know, they're perfectly social and I'm the introverted one. Maybe I should make the first move. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's good or or, or bad necessarily, it just is uh, unexpected, I guess, um, in that you assume that you go to a multiplayer game to interact with other people. And when it comes to light that perhaps uh, a majority of people aren't doing that, it just seems uh, it, it's unexpected to me. But I think... I would have said at one time that uh, the fact that you can't, you couldn't get a lot done without buffs, without other people in the earlier game was a good thing um, because it, it kept the social cohesion. But there, there's a strong sense of community, as you say, in Legends, which has a lot of convenience. It has five character slots, so you can have your buff bot, your entertainer. You can do it all yourself. But there are still these specific things in the game that call for a group like the heroics and some of the harder content, and you do need people to buy your stuff. You know, you need the economy, and that's that's a kind of it was it was it Raf Costa who was talking about hard, uh, strong ties and weak ties in the game. Yep, you heard yep, this exactly. phrase. You know, so you need you need those weak ties, which for people who don't know, it's it's basically for a crafter, a weak tie might be someone who provides you the resources um, so you don't have to go and farm them and the person who buys stuff from your vendor that's a social tie but it's a weak tie as opposed to a strong tie which is your uh, party member in a group uh, when you're doing a difficult heroic um, so there are those different kinds of social connections that can be in a game and you can have a mix of those um, it doesn't have to be kind of uh, one or the other, but I, th that's why I was going back to that that idea of those those original decisions because in the early days of EQ, it was the sense that right you can't do anything combat really without a group, and that they kind of lessened that with WoW and in EQ itself and in other games, so the more stuff was doable solo as a kind of a, a an acknowledgement of people people do like to do a lot solo, but it. it Maybe maybe what what you need are strategic things within a game that do call for a group and the the kind of I, I'm being really obvious now. I, I when I started this, I felt like I was making a really interesting point, but I'm making I'm making a, I'm making a really obvious point. But what I was going to say was well, it doesn't lead just because you can do an awful lot. Of, ha! Here we go. Try this. Just because you're doing an awful lot alone, it doesn't mean that the social glue of the game is going to fall apart. Absolutely. Maybe. Yeah, because those bonds aren't necessarily just between you and the game or you and other people, right? It's If, if you can look at your Star Wars Galaxy's aid and see that a thousand people came to your shop and bought something from you last month, mm -hmm. and that gives you all the warm, fuzzy feelings because you had these offline, these, like you said, these... these um, uh, weak binds, these weak ties to all of these people. And you're like, I helped all of those people do something in the game that they couldn't have necessarily done without me. I feel so good about that. Mm. And yet I didn't talk to any of them. <laughs> Not a single no. one of them. That's my, that's my preferred, that's my preferred interaction. 
I would love if I didn't have to talk to people, but it could still be social somehow. That would be perfect. That's just another way of getting different kinds of people in the game, right? There are going to be people who are out there who are putting together heroics every day, and they want they want new people every single time. For them, like finding new people and like doing this social content is their thing. This is like what charges them up. And some of us are like, oh my gosh, that sounds so stressful. I'm I'm going to stand over here and just run a vendor, okay? And mm. and we can at the same time and in fact we're you know we're providing each other services to me that's like that's like exactly what i want out of the sandbox i want all of those kinds of of people in there playing at the same time and then like working together even if they aren't even on the same screen at the same time that to me is amazing mm -hmm. i love that feeling you must get it as well as a crafter um one of my favorite things is when you log in and you get the little sound of the email that you've sold something <laughs> yes yes i love that that gives me such a ha ha ha, you know. Not even I, just that. I don't know if people do this to you, but I'll get like mail from people who are like, "Love your shop, gorgeous, you know, gorgeous stuff," or you know, "Thanks for thank, thanks for this," or "Thanks for selling me this." And that's like, even th that didn't cost them anything. That was like ten seconds of their time, and they didn't like, you know what I mean? It, it's but it still means so much to get a mail like that in a video game. I still I still lose it when I get stuff like that. I save every one of those. Yeah, I'm kind of getting that a little bit now with the YouTube thing, like people emailing and stuff. Because you, I'm I'm an introvert. I kind of keep my head down, and now the, the, I'm getting this weird sort of feeling that people are people are watching me when I'm when I'm in the game. It's it's slight, <laughs> it's slightly unnerving the number of people who I just run through more precisely, and someone sends me a tell, and it's like. Uh, like the videos and whatnot, and I'm like, who, 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 was, looking, who was looking at me? <laughs> yes, I've, I've had this happen because a couple, I guess it's been a couple of months, right when the quarantine started, I did a big video on crafting. Mm. And I don't think I've ever done anything on, like a, a video on Star Wars anything really before, which is kind of bizarre, kind of think of it. Maybe I should have done it before, but I didn't. And after that, I started getting the tells and I was like, oh, I thought I did a really good job hiding my name so that no, no one could find me. I apparently <laughs> did not do a good enough job. I think people, people, find me. people can piece it together through, you know, it just things like, oh, okay, that what's the environment in the background where, what <laughs> you know, they can do it, they can figure it out. But I, sh I should have, I, you know, I sometimes feel like I should have been more. But when I, when I, when I started playing Legends, I, I never imagined that, um, like, a, anyone would watch any videos I did about it. So I didn't really think about that at the beginning. And now I'm kind of like, I, I deleted a character and created one so I could be anonymous. Um, but then I needed a medic. So, so he's my yeah. medic now. So everyone knows who he is, but it's it's cool. I mean, it forces me out of my comfort zone, which is sort of alone most of the time, and forces me to be social like this, like talking talking to you or talking yeah. to people on stream. It may I think it's important to make yourself do things that are slightly out of your comfort zone every now and again. To otherwise, you just atrophy and become a, a hermit, <laughs> particularly uh, you know with COVID going on and things like that. Right, exactly. I think I think too maybe this this particular community is pretty low stress compared mm -hmm. to a lot of like live or like over the you know like uh, totally lawful MMORPGs that are run by you know professional studios that aren't kind of in this weird gray zone this shadow zone of of emulation where mm -hmm. like everybody here is so freaking chill like yeah. I can't remember the last time I had to ban like block somebody in in, in the game or like you know put somebody get rid of somebody on my friends list or really even do any of the things that would be commonplace in another, you know, in Guild Wars 2 or in WoW or in, you know, Star Wars Tour or anything like that. I, I'm just, I, I just feel like everybody is just really cool. And then the, the community events are positioned in such a way that like, I don't know. I just, I feel warm fuzzies when every couple of months they do one of these big giveaways where they're like, yeah, come on newbies, come on up. We're going to give you gobs of stuff. All of the crafters are going to come together on the server and do these huge donation giveaways and welcome people. And it's like, guys, this is an emulator. The well emulators are over there with cash shops and you guys are giving away stuff to newbies. <laughs> it's like a totally different vibe from some of these, these other, other games and I that makes me like more likely to come out of my shell and less likely to freak out that someone has figured out who I am because I don't feel like people are snooping me just to bother me I feel like people are like hey cool you know I know you awesome thanks for hanging out you know what I mean it's yeah so different 
Yeah, I, I've got that feeling as well, and I think it, I think it's people feel a part of something. That, you know, that it's a nice niche thing that people can feel like personally invested in, and um, there's also that thing of kind of I get uh, messages occasionally, just people like, I, why why have the team not got in touch with me? I I submitted my thing to be added to the Discord an hour ago, and I'm like, dude. <laughs> It's a, it's a bunch of you tell you so you're upset the free game that is being manned by volunteers <laughs> has not re, has not responded to you within the course of sixty seconds. It's like geez, um, so there there is that. There's going to be one one rotten egg, right? Every, everybody's yeah. got yeah. Um, well, I I think I think I should wrap it up and let you get back to your life. And um, I got I got harvesters a nap. I got to get. <laughs> You gotta gotta get those harvesters. I'm curious, how many harvesters do you have now? Uh, well, no, uh, factories. How many factories do you have now? Two, three, four, five food and chem, five uh, tailoring ones. They're mostly for armor smithing. Two structures and one, two, three, four. It's either four or five equipment. Oh my god! <laughs> it's way too many factories, and I don't cheat. I have one account. I do not cheat, so <laughs> they're all on my main account. Yeah, I just I couldn't keep up with it, but I've I've come across a really I I like doing the food stuff so I can get the feeling of I'm creating something from nothing from these resources. But I've stumbled across the reverse engineering system, which seems oh, to suit me yeah. a lot better. So it's like so I so much money, sorry, man. <laughs> say sorry, you cut out there. So much money in it, like it's yes, so profitable. Like uh, I I never really did get into it, no. but that's. I, so I don't make a lot of items, but I make fewer very high value items. So, so I can sit down for like two and a half hours, uh, manually craft the things at the keyboard while I'm listening to a podcast, listening to music. Then by the end, I've got ten skill attachments that I put on the vendor, and that, and then I can kind of switch off from the crafting. I've done my crafting. I don't have to think about it. That's that suits me a little bit better than. Uh, a, a large ongoing thing uh, I can kind of that's interesting it really is and it, it shows the difference between the types of crafting that you can do in the game right yeah I I like my factories because I feel like I'm running like I'm it's almost like a management sim mm -hmm. where you're trying to keep all the factories going and, and having all of the stuff that it's like a like a conveyor belt right that's just moving all of the, the factory boxes along whereas sometimes I have to make I'm hand making armor and I've been doing it for half an hour or whatever and I'm stocking and I'm going this kind of boring I'm just I'm just clicking I suddenly feel ah. like I'm playing World of Warcraft like I'm just playing any any old MMO just manually crafting so to me the schematic system feels so different that's what i like but i mean i like both but it, you, it just shows you can kind of do either one or both or a mixture and some people don't craft at all some people have vendors and all they do is buy stuff from other people i have people come through clear me out all the time and like sell my stuff they'll, they'll up market but like mm -hmm. in a more convenient location that doesn't bother me I no it doesn't bother me at it. all <laughs> it's like when someone does that buys up all your stock of something because they want to up the price it's like fine Let's go ahead I, that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got my i got my coin and then you know and it's still i also kind of like supporting that if they don't want to craft and their whole thing is buying low and selling high that's that's a valid play style i think that's really cool i'm glad the game supports that too yeah i think the crafting for me uh is always it's about the the feeling uh even though i say i don't want a lot of factories running don't want a lot of harvesters to have to think oh geez i need to go and pay maintenance and do all that stuff but um i do like that feeling that the you, the game is working for you when you're away from the game i've always liked that like um I remember standing around when you had to be logged in in EQ. I, I imagine it was similar to Ultima. You have to have your crafter logged in so that people can click on them and buy things from them. But I used to love that. You kind of park them in the bazaar at night, leave them overnight, and get up in the morning and see what they've sold. I've always loved that. And when they put that into EverQuest, I must have long since lost the game, last, left the game before they put that. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I, I, think, I don't think they put... I think it was a really early, wasn't it the really early version of EverQuest that that's how they did it? There were like these bizarre spaces um, where you would put your not, crafter? Not in the first couple of years. Okay. You mean maybe EverQuest 2? But I thought you sold out of your house in EverQuest. No. You have definitely had vendors. It still has vendors. I don't know. Yeah, 
because everybody would stand in like um we would stand in Freeport or whatever and spam. Okay. Oh my goodness. Do you go, oh, remember spamming like selling blah blah blah, wanting to sell blah blah blah, just for hours. Like every Saturday was Freeport spam day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. I don't what? know when they added vendors. It doesn't surprise me that they did though, because I know EverQuest Two has a system like that. So they probably just you know, back added it later. But after I left, I was only there for a couple of years before we moved on to Camelot. It sounds like you were there early on and they must have added this later. I didn't go into EQ straight away. Star Wars Galaxies was my first real MMO I played. I oh, remember, I see. Yeah, I got my first PC for um, Galaxies and in the run up to that, I played a little bit of EQ and uh, Anarchy Online was the first ever MMO I logged into. And, um, Anarchy online yeah I, um, <laughs> I remember being in the alpha test for that and it was terrible <laughs> <laughs> and it arguably like, still was when it launched <laughs> yeah <laughs> so many good stories from the old days and and it's hard to remember like this this stuff that's that's another thing i really like about emulators right because they they help you like keep fresh some of this stuff that would just be lost it would be lost because nobody has internet records the devs don't have this stuff nobody kept the code <laughs> And and we don't remember. I don't have all my screenshots from 1997 when you know when no. you came out. I don't have that stuff. It's gone. It's long gone. But emulators can help you bring it back. Yeah, and some of those early memories stick with you. I remember, like how this just wouldn't happen these days. I logged into Anarchy Online, and it feels like in my memory this was my first experience of the game. It probably wasn't, but in the tutorial zone, the newbie zone, and some guy appeared with a green name, and he was a helper, and he you know talked me through the beginning of the game and i i you know i don't know whether that that was probably a player volunteer but it's much more anonymous now there's there's no one manning those characters there's no one there who you oh, can actually talk yeah. to like that yeah, that's been one of my big pet peeves i have an article on that somewhere i'll send it to you now maybe you can mm. do something it's it's ages old but yeah i remember like when people in my own guild would be in like the guide program or the GM program for some of those old games. It wasn't like they weren't even just like not faceless employees. They were like people you actually knew who would like, who were helping, who were helping the community who actually kind of got tapped on the shoulder, got knighted by the studio to actually, you know, do stuff in the game. And now it's like, it's some customer service person who's not even in this country. <laughs> like it's yeah. they're like, they're working, you know, third shift somewhere. And this is just a, you know, this is just paying their bills. This is not, it doesn't feel like a community when, when games do things like that. This, this game is a little different. I mean, I don't, it's like all players, the whole thing is a volunteer operation. So yeah, like it already feels like there's the community, you know, the community and the, the Senate and the, the developers are like, really, there's a lot of overlap and mingling that kind of you know, defrays that, that nasty feeling from some other games. Yeah, you definitely get that feeling. They're like they're always asking for new CSRs and new people to get involved. I wonder how big. Uh, someone was asking me the other day, how big do you think this? Do you think it's going to get to the size of uh, City of Heroes? Like, will it? Ex no, that's how they put it. They said, will it explode like City of Heroes? I I, I wonder what you think. But I, I, my response was that it was. It's kind of the City of Heroes things is a unique case in that how it emerged all of a sudden that there was this fully fledged server that had been going for two years and everyone can flood in all at once or you know once they'd allowed people whereas this is star wars galaxies and emulation for galaxies has kind of evolved very slowly and there are all these different options do you think legends will like you think by next year it might have doubled its uh player base is that feasible Totally possible that it could double its player base. I'll say that because it's it's more than doubled its player base since I started playing. Yes, it, and that was only a couple of years ago. So I, I don't even know if they can handle it. Like, are they going to have to have a second server? Are they mm -hmm. going to have? I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't actually know what the physical limits on on Omega actually are. No. That's interesting. I don't think. It, I think you're right that it's not going to it's not going to blow up like City of Heroes because it's come the circumstances are different. We started playing emulators before Star Wars Galaxies was even close. This, this emulator, the original emulator existed and there was already like so much fragmentation of ideas for how to, you know, keep it going and different kinds of uh, literally different code bases, different, different, um, the NG has like came from a different place. Even it wasn't just a rebuilt emulator. It's like a copy. So mm -hmm. again, just totally different from the way city of heroes like exploded, 
and like a ton of people showed up for it, but most of those people don't still play. And then the fragmentation started. You know what I mean? They're yeah. almost like starting from a different point in time. And like even Homecoming, which has, don't get me wrong, a ton of players and more people than are on Legends. But like if you counted up the entire size of the Star Wars Galaxies community and compared it to the entire size of the current City of Heroes community, I'm guessing it's not only pretty equal, but most of the same over, like there's overlap between them. <laughs> it's like a lot of the same people because of when the games came out. And yeah. Though. Yeah, I was uh, I was hoping to do some more stuff with City of Heroes, but they 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 still sent out that kind of request for people to not do videos and things, um, which I, I still think is in effect, isn't it? Where they w they want people to be very careful about putting up streams and videos and things. Which I I'm even with Salas Galaxies, I'm well aware that it's kind of you know I could get in trouble for it, so I've stayed away from Homecoming. Is it do they do they still want people to not do that? Wow, that's that's still the prohibition. Yeah, I really want to jump into that game because it's it, it's one that I, I I don't think I ever got past level fifteen in that game, but I love the whole concept. It's it's the exact superhero MMO yep. that should be there. You want to create your own character. It, it wants to be unique. It's ridiculous things that they got absolutely right. You know, divorce your costume from the items that you're picking up through your leveling. They they got so much right in that game, and I'm just waiting for the point at which like legends you kind of feel like you've got the the light turns green now's the time i would love to get more into that game second favorite mmo in the world right yeah. after star wars Galaxies, and i don't think it's an accident they have a lot in common you wouldn't think they do because it doesn't have the same kind of economy but it has a lot of the same ideas that went into it in terms of allowing you to have freedom over everything freedom mm. over what you look like what you're doing at any given moment where you go it's it's the freedom of gameplay that grabs me Fulfilling the fantasy, I mean, that is what Galaxies did so well. And um, I thought for a while that I, I tend to gravitate towards IPs, you know, that fantasy of being in the Lord of the Rings or being in Galaxies. Or, But uh, City of Heroes does that with superheroes. This is a superhero fantasy and how close do you get to, you know, I would want to be in that brainstorming meeting when they're coming up with the game and say, What's the core fantasy that people want to express? And let's let's just try and do that. Forget everything else. We've got to get that core fantasy. Uh, and they seem to just do it so well with City of Heroes. Yeah, I I mean like I I, I want to let me let me chime in there on the subject of IP specifically because mm. I didn't even like superheroes and I still like City of Heroes. You don't like, like superheroes. I don't hate them or anything, okay. but I'm not like, I didn't grow up reading superhero comics. I wasn't like attached to the movies. I'm still not really attached to like the Marvel and DC movies. It's like, okay, that's a thing. It's a cool pop culture, culture thing, but it's not like what, what gets me up in the morning, right? It's not, I'm not a fangirl, yeah, yeah. but I really liked the way City of Heroes like made me like the whole idea of comic book characters. And on the flip side... I was a huge Star Wars fan. Like when I say I'm a huge Star Wars fan, Star Wars fan, I mean I was like in the 90s, like after nobody cared at all about Star Wars before they started coming out with the special editions and the prequels and stuff. I was that weird girl like dressing up as Princess Leia for Halloween <laughs> and going to the comic book store and buying trading cards and Can you rem Can you remember um <laughs> can you remember your feelings when there was the rumor of a Star Wars trilogy in book form at, when Heir to the Empire came out? When Heir to the Empire, oh my goodness, yes, because one of my best friends and I, like, we chipped in for that book so that we could both read it yeah. <laughs> when the Zom books came I was out. It was, I mean, so we were kids. We were, that must have been, like, sixth grade, seventh grade. I don't even remember. We were little kids. That Really, we were. But I was just, I was so obsessed. Like, my whole childhood is, like, Star Wars. I had my room decorated with posters. So, like, when they announced the Star Wars Galaxies MMORPG, and I'm already, like, knee deep in MMO has been playing for years and years and years. I was like, oh, heck yeah, I'm there. We're all there. Everybody I know we're going to play this game. But that's not the reason I stayed. Mm -hmm. Like, it was the reason I played it, but it wasn't like the things I ended up loving about it, like the Star Wars kind of fades to the background. And I don't even worry about that stuff. It ended up being the systems more than the IP. So I don't, I don't know. I, IP is like, they, they can grab you, but it's, it's got to actually be a good game or it's not going to keep you. It was really interesting that you said systems because I thought you were going to say people. And that's something that I feel guilty about sometimes because my guild, none of them play Star Wars Galaxies. Uh, I, I'm the only one. I'm all alone. I feel guilty because if it were about the people for me, I would be playing where my guild is, right? 
but I'm not. I'm playing where I enjoy the world and I enjoy the mechanics. Um, but I'm wondering if that is unusual. You know, like no matter how much you value community and people and the the social aspect of MMOs, mechanics and love of the IP or love of the world will always trump that. Do you do you feel like that? Can you play a game with uh, other people that you're not particularly interested in, but you'll play it for the people? I have done it. I have definitely done that in the past. I don't know. I'm not sure I am a representative sample for answering this question. Because like I said, I had a guild that had been around for years and I, we, we all just moved to Star Wars Galaxies. And then we, we were done with Star Wars Galaxies. We moved to the next game and then the next game and then mm. the next game. So, like I didn't ever have to give up the people I was friends with. We're all still in the same like we hang out in the same Slack channel. It's been oh, right. like, okay. over 20 years. So I have like the same people, some of whom I recruited in Star Wars Galaxies were still <laughs> friends, right? So like it was never a question of like having to leave them behind to play a game that has the mechanics I want. Like mm -hmm. I can play that right now and then go over and talk to them whenever I want. And maybe, maybe even if you don't have a guild like that or you don't have an experience like that, you can still see how that's changed MMOs for sure because that's meant that the social glue isn't necessarily inside of the game. It's outside of the game. And so the games can't exploit that anymore, right? They can't, they can't force you. They can't make you feel like you have to play or you won't get to see your friends anymore because that's just not true. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's right. It, it, it just became gradually more fragmented as time went on. I think, well, I mean, we, we were all together and in the run-up to Star Wars tour, we were all kind of, what's our guild going to be called? We're going to do all this. We're going to go into the game and recreate the guild within that game. And then that kind of didn't quite pan out because the game perhaps wasn't as social and, and gluey as, as it could have been. So over, over the years, it's become more and more fragmented to the point, I mean, they're all still there. They're there. I can see the icon for my guild, but I don't tend to go in because you tend to, uh, the frames of reference are different and people are into the games that they're into. So my thing with Galaxies was always like, you know, it's always, it, it's great that the social glue exists outside the games, but there's nothing quite like having people who are into the game that you're playing and having be the, be the best of both worlds. You know, I, I realized, you know, if I want to play Galaxies with people, I'm going to have to make new friends, which is not easy at 42, but you have to <laughs> force yourself to like, all right, I need to make new friends. Um, but, you know, so that for me, again, talking about, like pushing yourself that's been good it's it's interesting because i'm always thinking about the um there's still the prevalent view that uh games are somehow antisocial or um escapism and who was i who was i listening to the other day it was a famous famous person a comedian noteworthy person talking about the fact that look uh, I was I was saying to my son during the uh, COVID crisis, look, you can't spend all the time on the PlayStation. You've got to you've got to do stuff. And he was saying, but Dad, I'm yeah. being <laughs> more social than you're being. I'm talking to all my friends in Minecraft right now. How is this not social? And it's like, yeah, that's a really good example. That's what I think. <clears throat> I, I'm not even sure I have anything to to add to that honestly i i feel like mmos have done a really poor job of of recapturing that experience because i mean when when i talk about my guild personally like yes i still love them i would literally give these people off the shirt off my back i've met many of them in real life multiple times they're everything to me i've i've been carrying with them through all my many moves across the country for so long and yet even looking at that the first year of star wars galaxies was probably like our best experience because it mm -hmm. wasn't just we're connected like in a chat channel and, and you know sharing baby pics and everything you know as <laughs> as we've grown up like grown up together and gotten married and had children and you know all the stuff that humans go through right but playing a game together has that totally different experience when you're all working toward like we had a city we were all working toward a city and we had these giant role-playing plot lines and we had a huge merchant district so all the people who didn't role play and instead they just wanted to be traders they did that and we had a pvp subgroup and they did nothing but you know gank rebels all day and it, it's really hard to top that kind of like on boots on the ground kind of experience where you're really feeling like you're shoulder to shoulder with with your friends in you know, a virtual experience as opposed to a chat channel. It really does feel different. And I, yeah, I would does. say that, like, our personal 
golden age as like um you know as a guild and yet at the same time you can't do that forever nobody can can recreate that in every game people grow up people's lives change so maybe trying to make that happen every time isn't isn't a great idea and then at the same time like you said you can always make more friends not even new you're not replacing your friends you're just adding to the pool you're just you're just making more yeah, I mean, I you, like can't, you can't expect your friends to be in the same place you are all the time. You know, you've got to find people who are experiencing what you're experiencing, have the interest that you do at that specific time. It doesn't mean you have to abandon your old friends, but it's like that's how you get that kind of in the moment experience rather than trying to drag people who are not that interested into it. Find other people who are passionate about it. But I do that I, sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, we're playing ESO. Everybody come play, and everybody's like, uh, "I don't want to." But you know, some people show up. In- I have dragged a couple people into Star Wars Galaxies. They don't stay, but they do show up, and that's something. <laughs> Did um, I, I assume because on the podcast, um, Justin jumped into Galaxies, but there's I, I may have missed a post on massively uh, the website, but he hasn't talked much about his experience jumping in. Did he stay, or is? I don't- he did no. i don't want to speak but i'm pretty sure he didn't i i don't i don't blame people because there's so many other games out there to play and there's a lot of competition right they, they might not be making sandboxes but there's a lot of other stuff to play and he's a hardcore lotro player and a ddo player and there's lots of stuff pulling him away and it's really hard for him when he or for anybody who doesn't have that like deep attachment to the original game to like get sucked in and yeah. and that was what i was trying to do with with my video like a couple months ago i was trying to show people like what does the end game or the mid game of a crafter even look like? Because at the beginning, like when you're zoning into Tansari Station, that's nothing like the rest no. of the game. The rest of the game is nothing like that. And really, even when you're running around doing like lobby quests in Mos Eisley, that's not really what the rest of the game is like either. Nobody's going to be doing that for the whole game. And it's a really bad representation for how it plays. You kind of just, you just need to know where you need to have watched videos. And that was what I was trying to do. It was like fill a gap, <laughs> show people, okay, it's mostly spreadsheets. If you love spreadsheets, you're going to love this game. If not, maybe go kill crate <laughs> yeah i mean that's what i've been trying to do with a lot of my videos is kind of just give information and talking about the issue of accessibility and what you might like to see in the game one i i would put first for me is improve the new player experience like i did this video how to auto attack because as you jump into it, the nge yeah, you put- in the macro system and the the control system first thing before you even leave the station yeah you you can't actually play the game in the optimal way with the default settings you've got to set it up you've got to get back to tab tab targeting you've got to set up your auto attack so you can actually move the camera move around and tackle the enemies and navigate through the world in an intuitive way and it's like i'm not sure i mean you can play you can they improve the accessibility in one way with the ng but you can't play end game content the way it's set up when you jump into galaxies legends like you try and do try and do a heroic with those keyboard settings (laughs) you are going to be screwed so it's like i think you know one of the things would be just guys just set the keyboard up in the way it needs to be played like (laughs) pre-nge basically um and that would improve the accessibility because even nowadays most people who jump into an mmo want to tab target they want to auto attack and you can't do that as default in Legends at the minute. Yeah, and I almost, I almost feel sorry for him because it's not like, I mean, they're saddled with that, right? Some of that stuff is hard coded and yeah. it's not going to be change. You almost need to rewrite the tutorial to explain how to fix your own client to make it not suck. I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> I mean, we were talking, like, it doesn't make sense. And here, I'm constantly telling newbies, oh, yeah, you need to get this this UI that makes the game look like 2003. And I feel like I'm getting these, these crazy pants stares back like, Brie, that's nuts. Why would I do that? Like, just trust me on this one. You need to do that. But that's that's the reality. The NGE was not kind to the, the interface, and it's no. a real problem. You're absolutely right. At the end of that tutorial, I feel like there should be a disclaimer that comes up now that says none of that is relevant to the majority of what you will be doing from this point on. Um, it's, it's, it's. I'm not sure if that new that initial experience is a. Oh, I, I've never voiced this to this extent. I thought about the auto attack thing and the tab targeting, but maybe that whole tutorial needs to be ripped out of the game. And into the sun. <laughs> yeah. 
it's it's just not good. And then I think I've even complained about this before. Like it doesn't even have that thing where you know, like when you finish um, a, a quest point or a, like a mission. A, you know, what I forget what they call them, a mission point in the legacy quest line, and then like somebody will radio you with the next one, and so you can just go to that one. Uh-huh. Instead, you're constantly going back to the NPCs. Over it's not even a good tutorial, like at all. Let alone for legends, it's terrible. I have. I have so much anger for this tutorial. <laughs> when right. you Turn the whole thing and start it over. Start it over and start. There must be, without having to recode it, there must be a way to switch on oh, something like it's modal chat. You need to rebind. You need to bind a key to uh, something like attack and repeat, repeat default attack or something. Just make that a little tick box to have that as the default. But then I realized there are probably people, I have a friend in the game who does, he he still has that system. I might be insulting you, maybe use it, you use this system, but it's the one where you kind of, you don't fire buttons from the hot bar, you select one with the right mouse. So that's the special that you have set up and you uh, I, I keep saying to him, "You're gimping yourself. You need to. You need to streamline this shit." Yeah, no, I'm. I'm with you. I have Y set up to the the automatic. Uh, I forget what it's called, like automatic fire or something, and then T set up for like auto attack. Yeah. <laughs> and then tab, I set my tab up. I have everything set up. I want it. I want it to play like the old days. And you can't really, because the old days had that really cool system where you could like line up your. Your, you could like set up your next five attacks. Like yeah, it was like huge, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, that's what it was called. I did, I do miss that. But like, I would, I'll take what we can, we can hack out now, than have to deal with like that stupid NGE button and the right clicking and the thing where you're set off to the. There's so much that drives me crazy about the NGE, but mm-hmm. the the UI really truly is one of the big ones. <laughs> All right, Dev. So here's what we want. We want the auction hall to sort like <laughs> normal humans would would sort and search for things, and then we want the whole newbie tutorial and the UI fix. This is like so easy, right? <laughs> it's like quality of life. It won't bring you any new players. It, it won't up yeah, the profile ignore us. of the I'm server. Seriously, ignore us because you know what brings people. You know, the, one of the best posts we had last week was the one with a big old picture of maybe it was this week of Bespin mm-hmm. because you guys are working on Bespin. That is the stuff that. MMO players want to see. They yeah. want to see big, flashy new content, beautiful clouds and towns and stuff like that. They don't care about UI. That's just that's no. just hardcore players like us. Yeah, it's always that that stuff is always the stuff that's going to be sneaked in under the radar. I still um, look back with amusement to the thing uh, towards the end of uh, no, maybe it wasn't the end, but people wanted gardening. Gardening is. It. Do you remember this? There was like always a post for what should be added to the game. We want gardening. No, I don't remember this. It was a, I guess the, this, was, this was like the height of Farmville, so maybe that's why. I, I, I think it was people, the people like uh, l- like us who want the social system, want the systems, want the crafting and a new activity to take place in. But they were always, uh, they were always talking about gardening. It seemed to be, and it was like on the cards, constantly on the cards. But there was there was never the interest for it, and it, it, it never made it into the game. But. I um, want gardening. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I they would were, totally show up for that. I think they started working on it. They 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 talked about it in a in a fair amount of detail that you know this is how it would work and stuff, but it just never made it into the game. I don't know how it would have panned out in terms of zoning and where your garden would have been, but there are certain uh, there are certain houses that have a roof space and things that maybe you could have put put plants in. Oh, I don't that know. That would be so cool. Yeah, I, that's the kind of stuff that makes me really excited about being in an emulator that's advancing. And like I said, mm. one of the things I didn't like about the original was that they were their mandate, right, was to make it a classic version of the game, which yeah. is totally fine and I respect it. But it's not what I wanted. I wanted something that was going to take what SOE had, the, the pinnacle of what SOE had done, although I'd really like to see Atmo flight back in. But I'll take this. Right? Oh, you don't know. Oh, really? I loved Atmo Flight. Oh. oh, I loved it. Oh, my goodness. It was awesome. <laughs> this podcast ends now. Sorry. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, they, they took that and then they were like, and let's do some more. Let's add on to that. Let's dig into everything we can find. Let's add new buildings. Let's, you know, fix things that people didn't like. Let's fix 
all just so many bugs and other issues and then let's build more let's you know borrow from some of the other servers in the community like um, contributions that people are like making a planet and then a lot of servers are taking it and kind of running with it let's let's work on that and that excites me i want to see forward move and i don't just want to play like you said in the past i want to play in the future no and that's one of the early things i think when i think about pre-ng star wars galaxies i do think of those early days when they're literally there are no resources there's nothing on the server has been crafted yet and the fun of that early game is building the cities and building the infrastructure and when you look at something like basilisk which has been around for goodness knows oh how many goodness. years yes, now it's so bloated if you go to that server for that experience that's not going to happen because it's the the actual people playing the game are so established all the cities are in place so you're not going to get that early game experience so unless you really love i, I don't know the the, the 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 freedom i guess of the early game and just how it felt then then fine but um really it's a pretty it's a mature server at this stage and everything is kind of locked in so you don't get that early game experience yeah. either really but Legends is getting there too. I mean, it's really hard to get a city now. Mm. It's not that, that they never turn over. I definitely see some, especially on like the secondary planets, but it's it's starting to look star cider ish as far as I can tell. You know, it's starting to get packed, it's starting to get laggy from so many people, it's starting to it's gotten to the point where they have to shift the PvP around and it's really hard to get a town. I'm I'm not even really complaining. I just yeah, I don't know. That's... I don't. I, I, someone was talking about this in the chat the other day, like lamenting the early game experience, the frontier spirit of starting it. When we're trying to figure out, well, how can you keep that going as a rolling thing? It's not really possible. Every everyone's going to move out of that situation, that starting situation. Every server's going to leave that behind. So, like we were thinking, like, is there a could there be an emulator that basically resets every six months and, and people join that oh, server? Wow. They go through like, almost like, um, you know, the progression servers and stuff and just have that as a rolling thing. We just reset every month. Would would people, would there be an, enough people to even be interested in something like that? I don't know. That's really interesting. I, I don't know. I guess it depends, like, how many people play on test servers because test servers kind of emulate that experience yeah. already. yeah. I will say back in the old days, I would log into like, I have played on more than one server. Once I moved everything to Starsider, that was like my home. But then I was, I got bored. You know, you always get bored a little bit. And so I branched out to another server and kind of restarted over there. And then I played both. And then I kind of made it like a practice to like every couple of weeks, I would log into a server I didn't play on and like, start with nothing and see what I could do. Mm. Like you start with nothing but knowledge. I mean, technically I'm bringing all this knowledge along with me. What what can I buy? What can I sell? How can I make money? What Can I start from scratch without, you know, going out and doing missions and making the money the way you'd normally make it? And I kept doing that and that was kind of fun. I could definitely see that as, as a fun thing, but man, I really like having my house and my crafts and, you know, all of the, the foundational things that make you a, cause can imagine losing your, your resources every six months. Oh, heck no. Yeah. Right. I mean, that would just, that would suck. That This is not a game that's built around a six month timeline. They'd have to completely change the way that works <laughs> to make that work. Yeah, right? and You'd have to be in some kind of discord channel, masochists, discord channel, that just, <laughs> you just put them. <laughs> <laughs> through the through this torture every six months and guys we're in it again we're going to start from the beginning again all together like it's uh, already torture right because i mean what was the last time we had some of these resources that are good there is some that haven't spawned in years that people really yeah. really need and they would never spawn there would be whole things that didn't get made in that in that version of the game I was but it's, a, it's a cool idea and it's definitely a big problem like what do you what do you do when when a sandbox is mature this is like not just a star wars problem this is an every sandbox problem what happens when you know some people have taken over the sandbox have all the toys and new people show up and they want to play but there's no toys left how do you redistribute do you just keep adding new planets because i feel like that might kind of help right to get people mm -hmm. to continue spreading out you're giving them more planetary space giving them more city space and so some people will move and some people will start fresh and let their old ones decay and it just kind of moves people around like i always felt like there's so much space in star wars galaxies for houses but not really very many for cities and there's no purpose to the cities either, but they're a thing that you can get. So of course everybody goes out to get them and now they're, they're like a limited resource and they're not even useful. <laughs> the whole thing kind of doesn't make any sense. I don't even live in a player city right now. That's, that's how useless they are as far as I can see outside of the social. And so I don't stress about that. 
but they are representative of of the you know of the maturity and not necessarily in a good way of the server yeah i kind of uh, it's one of those things that if you miss the boat if you're not in a guild at that critical time unless you start your own guild with the the idea of building a city you kind of you're going to kind of miss that opportunity it's like one of those weird you know systems that uh, i don't know caters to a, a small subset of the player base in a way not very many people get to experience that you remember when they used to do live events and um you know uh, they would man and things and ultimately became a thing of okay 100 people saw this saw this event out of so many so it's kind of like and that's i think that was the reasoning behind them giving the tools to the players you know you can you can do these events now with the event system um but i feel like that might be the same with cities as well it's that you have that small window to get involved with the development of the city and then it's gone it's kind of weird i think i would probably start over with cities nap i i have always felt that they were way too easy to get i know legends has put in like they've tamped down on the rules they made it more expensive they require more players i think than they used to Mm -hmm. to actually run the cities but i don't think it's even close to as many like as they should be requiring i I don't think think it's nearly not not when you have five characters it's like yeah i think they basically doubled it maybe tripled it but even that it's kind of like you can easily uh, do that with a, a small number of players and that that's part of the problem. I mean, really, if if they would just bite the bullet on that and just make the requirements really high and make the expense really high so mm-hmm. that this was really a luxury thing to maintain a city instead of what it is now. Like, I, I've always thought they should do that, but I also understand why they don't because they don't really want nobody to use the system, right? They want somebody. It's it's another way of, of gluing people to the game. So they're trying to uh, play into that. But you know, SOE was always chicken about it too, about chicken about <laughs> increasing those rents and things like that. So and uh, yeah, I want house pickups. Yep. Legends, house pickups. And I want them rolling. I want always there to be house pickups. If people wow. haven't logged in in two or three months, they need to lose their stuff. It needs to go into their and not lose it into their data pads. That's just all there is to it. They can't, they can't hold territory forever when they're not even playing. Give it to the new people who are showing up. Yeah, and I don't think maintenance makes any difference whatsoever. You can, you can basically, Zero. you yeah. can pay that maintenance with the, with the way the economy is in Legends. You can just pay it for infinity, basically. <laughs> Once you've made a little bit of money in the game, you'd never really have to think about maintenance ever again. So it needs to be a timer rather than a, a, a thing of paying maintenance for sure. Yeah. No. And I'm not saying this because it would benefit me. I mean, Just, I'm going to keep playing, right? I'm going to get all my territory still. I, I'm not going anywhere. You can pry me away from this game. But I know there are like people around me who have not logged in. You can just, you know, you haven't seen them in like half a year. But there are other people who would really like to hang out. They would like to put their house down in that primo spot. So let them. Like, yeah, I, I, and also me. keep parts of the world looking like a wilderness as well. You know, you <laughs> want parts of Tatooine to look deserted. That's that's part of Tatooine. So I think it would add to the, oh God, I hate using the word immersion. Immersion. But, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but you do want to feel like you're in the middle of nowhere and then someone's house that isn't even the right design for a house on Tatooine just pops out of nowhere in, <laughs> in the middle of the dune sea and you just think, ah, oh, jeez. You know what I hate are Mustafarian bunkers. I, I would uh, take every musty bunker and delete them straight from the you know game. Why I know they, everybody with a bunker right now is hating me, but I would. <laughs> but be they, they're flipping free as well. You get one for free, so it's like yep. everyone's got one. I hate them. I hate I hate searching through. Everyone who's got a Mustafarian bu- bunker puts the vendor on the bottom floor at the back. <laughs> So, so you have to go through all the, and they've got they've decorated it beautifully, but there are all these false walls now. That I'm like, where the hell am I in this house? It's like Santa's grotto, trying to find this vendor. It's crazy. Yeah, I agree on you, that one. You, you could not be more right. <laughs> That's so <laughs> funny. I'm so glad that I am not the only one who is driven insane by that. Well, I, I want rather- to. Go, 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 go. I'd rather deal with any, like, Tatooine Large or Naboo Large. Those suck, but I'd still rather deal with those than the... than the. At least they laid out, like, a logical house. In, so, you know, I want to give these people... I don't know anything about buying and selling. I'm not a business person, but I know the vendor should be visible. I know you need to know where to go to buy the items. That's like... I don't know, no, that business 101 right? or something. Put it in front of the elevator. Don't make me get on the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> These are like super duper pet peeves at this point. Now we've just gone off the rail. 
uh, they they could be pro tips really if people are doing such illogical things with their vendors. Oh, well, I really I really feel like I should let you go now, Bree. We've been talking for over two hours, um, but it's been a I've huge been, amount I've been of fun. talking your ear off for two hours. No, I've really enjoyed it. I don't often get the chance to talk, you know, in depth about stuff. So I, I really appreciate it. And to talk to someone who's so knowledgeable and... Um, shares oh, shares the <laughs> shares the passion it's um yeah, yeah yeah it's nice yeah thank you so much for having me on this this has been awesome i mean i've been i've been watching your videos i watch your videos because they're soothing <laughs> they're soothing because they're soothing and you know what you actually helped me so much a couple of weeks ago because i was watching one of your videos and you had the whole walkthrough for how to get uh to go through the mini valerian theme park and get the um rickshaw so i use I oh listen yes to your, every single thing going okay what's he doing no what's he doing okay he's <laughs> hunting for and then you hunted for the boxes for like a half an hour <laughs> it's like well this is going to be a great experience if even he can't find them on his stream but you helped me and i got my rickshaw so thank you <laughs> you're welcome well someone helped me with that that's the good thing about doing it like um you know you jump into the game and someone will see that you're online and someone just said i'll take you through it so i just followed that guy basically he did a lot of it for me so that was uh, that was great as well um, it's an awesome server it I, really truly is are you enjoying your rickshaw do you use it often <laughs> i honestly haven't used it since i got it once oh. i realized it was no trade when I, I had it on my chef in the old game and so i was hoping i could trade it and i can't did you Devs, please make everything shared trade because that's please. so frustrating I would love. I, there's another item in that uh, quest which is no trade. It's the droid bath, um, like um, Ooh, you know what? oil I bath. I stopped after I got the. Oh, you've got to get it. it there's but, more. I but, should keep going. But again. do it. Um, yeah, it's like the droid bath that C3PO gets dunked in in A New Hope. Oh, cool. Okay. It's such a. I think it's new. It's it's like really nicely modeled and everything. I think it'd be a great um, fixture for any house. However. Um, it's no trade, so you've got to make sure you do it with the person who owns the house uh, you want to put it in. Uh, that's so frustrating. So, I hate that. Uh, if you and obviously that's usually your crafter, non non combat character who right. has the house. So ah, I was so annoyed. I got it, but it's on the wrong character. Um. Yeah, but it's a cool fix item. Fix that, devs. Fix it. I really <laughs> am. We should we should put together a giant word doc that's just nothing but like requests and make the Senate. <laughs> That's their punishment for volunteering to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. I say thank you, Bree, and I'll stop this video uh, recording at this stage. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Bree. Uh, and here to Star Wars Galaxies nerds waffling for two hours long. Thank you again, Bree. <laughs> thank you so much, Nav. Later, everybody. All right. Bye bye. So one day I'll give my guests the chance to plug their stuff properly. I'll do it now. Massivelyop.com is where you're going to keep up with all the latest MMO news. If you have any thoughts about the topics discussed, don't hesitate to use the comment section. That's what it's there for. Let me know if you enjoyed the podcast. Any thoughts about future episodes, do let me know that as well. Thanks once again for listening. Mm -hmm.